This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. We're joined by an old friend of mine, uh, a writer with whom many of you are already familiar, the great James Bovard. So, Jim, how are you doing today? Hey, doing good, Jeff. Thanks so much for having me back on your program. Well, I wanted to talk to you for a few reasons. One is kind of a follow-up to a show we did last week with Ryan McMakin, where we discussed police abuse and, and the FBI. Uh, among other things, Jim has <laughs> a conscientious, excuse me, a contentious article out in The Hill about the FBI's a secret police. But uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Jim Bovard, he is a, a longtime author. He's written many books about uh, federal government overreach a longtime writer at uh, USA Today, at the Wall Street Journal, uh, at places like The Hill. And he's actually got a new book coming out. It's available on Kindle. It's called Freedom Frauds, Hard Lessons in American Liberty. And it features some of the articles he's written over the years for our friends at the Future of Freedom Foundation. So I'm going to recommend that to you. It's on Amazon under James Bovard. So that said, Jim, uh, let, let me get, you know, one of your great themes over the years is, is this moronic tribalism in politics. Um, give us your thoughts on the Roy Moore debacle. <laughs> oh, God. Well, it was a mess, but this is, I mean, it, it was, you know, there were a lot of Alabama voters who felt like they had to choose between a child, molest, child molester and a baby killer. And it's, it's a, a default of the entire political system when it comes down to a choice like that. And they're supposed to uh, uh, sprinkle their holy water in one of the candidates' heads when many, if not most, of the voters were mortified by both candidates. Same as what happened last year with the presidential election. But we see this recurring. It never seems to end, this whataboutism where, where people accept something from their guy or gal which the, the, the same conduct they, den, they denounce when it's the other side's guy and gal, guy or gal. How, how do we ever get past this? Is there ever a political end to this? Uh, I'm supposed to say something optimistic here, right? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, you know, it's probably not going to have a happy ending. And the, uh, the point that I've made, a similar point to what y'all have made for a long time, is, is that the second best solution is to minimize the power of winning politicians, because it's almost impossible for voters to put a leash on them. It's almost impossible to know what exactly they're doing or, uh, or you know, or exactly who is giving them favors, be it money or promises or sex or whatever. We find out years later and we're shocked. It's like, no, this is uh, this has been the history of government. And it's become far more so once the government's become far more interventionist, once there was a federal law and policy for almost everything under the sun. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it, how, how neither side seems to understand the folly of, of granting all this power uh, to an, an organization that might not be controlled by them. Um, you know, one of the great things about your career is as libertarians, we're conceptually opposed to the state, but a lot of times we're not all that interested in the details. But the, the, the rest of the world is very interested in the details. And one thing you've always done is you've gone in and, and in a journalistic fashion uh, expose some of the rottenness of, of organizations like the FBI most recently, but the FDA, all, all kinds of boondoggles. Do you think as liberty-minded people, we do a bad job of, of showing the details sometimes? <laughs> uh, you know, here again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sound positive today. I mean, it's almost Christmas. Um, you know, I think you're right. I think uh, that many libertarians simply don't care about the details. Once they uh, read Ayn Rand or read some other theoretician, they think they have all the answers, and then they think that they should simply tell other people the theory, and then people, if people are smart or honest, they will say, yes, that's the truth. I mean, it's a little bit similar to what Marxists did in the late 1800s, where they had Marxist theory, so they didn't need to understand how the economy worked. But uh, my experience is uh, uh, it's far easier to persuade people of the value of freedom and the danger of government if it's possible to uh, quote chapter and verse of the horror stories of what government has done. And part of it is, is I've always had kind of a twisted sense of humor and going after some of these programs and studies. And it's just it's uh, you know, it, it's fun to dig in and try to find that single detail that will make people's eyes uh, open up if not make their head snap back. It's like, you know, you know, to, to try to get the holy Shazam response to a uh, federal horror story. 
But it's also giving you a bigger platform, right? When, as opposed to writing some theoretical libertarian article about the state, when you write an, a nitty gritty article about, let's say, the drug war, somebody like the Wall Street Journal is far more interested in that uh, th- than they are something about, let's say, Austrian economics. Sure, uh, uh, that's true. I mean, it's a bit of an unfortunate example. The um, you know the Wall Street Journal has been supportive of the drug war uh, probably uh, since I don't know when. There was a really good editor they had uh, in the 1980s, Tim Ferguson, who pushed back against that, but he you know he didn't last that long or long enough. Uh, so, but no, there have been other places that have been open for the issues in the drug war, but it's just it's you know I've found. It's a lot easier to persuade people if you have specific examples. And maybe that's partly because the area that I live in is full of government workers and people who are very uh, pro-government. But every now and then there's someone who I talk to and it's possible to watch their eyes and and uh, almost sense that the wheels are starting to turn. And they're starting to say, oh, well, that's not good. And then to try to build from that to help them make the induction to make them recognize the government does a lot of bad things across the board. Well, this article you wrote earlier this week in The Hill, it's called Yes, the FBI is America's Secret Police. We'll link to it. Uh, tell us, what was the genesis of this piece? Did The Hill solicit it or, or how, did, how did it come to be? Uh, there, was a, there was an article, um, there, was, there was a, been a lot of controversy on uh, the FBI lately because of questions about their role in the 2016 presidential election and questions about the, their investigation of the Trump campaign. And there was a, um, a Fox News commentator said last Friday that the that the FBI become America's secret police. Well, th- there was a liberal group called PolitiFact, which uh, gave a pants on fire uh, label for that criticism of the FBI secret police. I saw that and I said, ooh, this is a nice setup because there were, you know, not only did the, the liberal group say, you know, it's not true, but, but it went through and basically said, well, you know, you have to recognize that the FBI is, has democratic accountability and has to obey the law. There's checks and balances. They're very careful. And those were basically a series of setups for me to um, do chapter and verse of evidence to the contrary. Mm-hmm. Well, it's it's a great article. And it what, what strikes me, not only by the PolitiFact uh, uh, review of it, but also some of the comments. It's just this, this credulousness that people continue to have towards the federal government. It, it just seems like it, it's an enduring feature of the American mindset. Uh, enduring feature. I mean, um, you know, it's maybe it's a question: is what is it a bug or a feature? And certainly, the history looks more like a, a feature. And, and you know, it's interesting during the nineteen nineties. After Waco and Ruby Ridge, a lot of conservatives recognized that the FBI had far too much power. After 9-11, there was, there was a, a rally around the government reflex. The number of Americans who trusted the government to do the right thing doubled in the weeks after 9, the 9-11 attacks. Conservatives became far more supportive, but a, a number of liberal groups became saying, no, wait a minute, you know, the FBI's, you know, helping lock people up without charges. We can't find out where they went. We have no idea how many people are locked away, and the FBI starts all these entrapment operations. Um, so, however, uh, you know, it's it's gone back and forth. Once President, uh, once Obama became president, liberals became much less critical of the FBI, and now that the FBI is apparently in the front of the Trump investigation, liberals have put a halo over the agency. And this is this is appalling because liberals have done a lot of great work. From 1924 onwards, pointing out the danger of a secret uh, police agency with vast arbitrary power. Yeah, and let's let's not forget, as we as Ryan and I pointed out last week, there's no constitutional provision for federal police, and we see what federal police are doing in Spain to the Catalans. It's not it's not a, a happy thought that that we need another layer of cops. Yeah, and it's and uh, you know there are there are so many evidence, uh, so many layers of evidence that show that that's the case. And yet, you know, it, it was interesting pulling together some of the research for this piece and uh, trying to say, okay, so uh, so I, I, uh, there's quotes that FBI agents are taught in their, in their ethics course at the FBI Academy that it's okay for them to lie to people or to lie to targets of FBI investigations. Okay, that's interesting, that's abstract, but then I was doing a little more digging 
and found this great Washington Post piece from two years ago that talked about how false FBI trial testimony had helped sentence over 30 people to death who might have been innocent. You know, I would think that liberals might give a darn about that. But it's like, well, you know, uh, he's a Russian agent. I mean, that was, you know, th that was one of the more uh, popular comments, uh, responses to the Hill article, labeling me a Russian agent. But, you know, I don't even speak Russian. Well, it, it, it's uh, it's amazing to see the the, the uh, civil liberties left just become what, what it, their formerly civil liberties left become what it's become. And, and one of the great examples of this is... <laughs> You really touch on a sacred cow here. The left is really shameful when it comes to anything dealing with the Branch Davidians or David Koresh. It, it, it's some sort of hot oh. button for them. Yes, and you know, it's, uh, there are exceptions to that. I mean, the folks at Counterpunch have always been great, and the people on Counterpunch are still great on the FBI. Uh, there are some other liberal organizations. I think the folks at Fair Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting are probably still good. I haven't seen much of their stuff in the FBI. And, and there's other, uh, Glenn Greenwald's probably very good on this. Uh, he's done very good civil liberty stuff. Um, but if you look at the Washington Post or the commenters or most of the uh, mainstream media, it's like that they've all, you know, put on their blindfolds and gotten in line. And it's, it's interesting. Back in the 1960s, conservatives, some conservatives would put bumper stickers on their cars saying, support your local sheriff. Well, nowadays, I expect to see on Priuses, bumper stickers saying, uh, support your secretive, all-powerful federal agent. <laughs> I want to see a Prius with a bumper sticker that says, support your local coal-burning power plant. Um, That's great. Yes. I mean, it's – and so and those folks are so pious. It, it yeah. drives me nuts. It almost drives me to drink. But this latest – uh, round uh, of public comment on the FBI. It, it's all about Hillary in the election, isn't it? It's all w when Comey was when they thought Comey had blown the election for Hillary. The FBI was a rogue agency. Now that they think the FBI is behind the Mueller investigation of the Trump Russia uh, idea, the FBI is, is uh, uh, an agency that has to be respected. Well, you know, it's it, it's one thing to have to have respect, but it's something completely different to venerate them, and uh, that's the thing which has me kind of um, shaking my head uh, uh, ruefully. Is that you have all these liberals who are basically trying to expunge the FBI's entire history. It's like, well, Martin Luther King, well, that's an asterisk. COINTELPRO, that's an asterisk. Uh, the, the J. Edgar Hoover's secret list of up to 20,000 Americans who would be seized and locked up in, in six federal detention camps that were built in the 1950s, which supposedly was some kind of BS conspiracy theory. But no, that's what they actually did. And we didn't find, find out about it until long afterwards. Well, imagine J. Edgar Hoover with today's uh, spying technology. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, uh, to, have, to have J. Edgar Hoover... Uh, tracking every email and J. Edgar Hoover knowing exactly who's uh, um, with J. Edgar Hoover knowing exactly which members of Congress sent which pictures of their anatomy to other people. So that uh, that could get ugly fast. Well, it's it's interesting, though, because we've heard, uh, you know, talk about members of Congress, members of various administrations fearing the CIA and what the CIA could do to them covertly, that the CIA is unaccountable. Even Truman said that he regretted creating it. We haven't heard that as much about the FBI. If I was a member of Congress right now uh, who had some uh, things in, in my past that I didn't want to come out that were po potentially uh, findable via metadata or electronics, um, I'm not sure I'd be out front criticizing the FBI. Well, yeah, and there was a comment that Hale Boggs made in 1971. He was the House Majority Leader at the time, and he said that, that the fear of the FBI had completely stymied uh, congressional criticism. And um, it, it was great he made that comment, and his pushback helped spur on probably the Church Committee, which did a great report in 1976. But nowadays, there's a handful of congressmen who, is, who, are, who speak out, but um, it's hard to find uh, it's hard to find uh, congressmen with uh, both intelligence and courage, as you might have uh, as you might recall from your time as Ron Paul's chief of staff. So, well, you know, you've been around D.C. Uh, you've been writing for a long time. 
you know, give us your take. Do you really think that things are different today? Do you think that the atmosphere is more poisoned, uh, uh, more divisive than it's ever been? Or do you think that we just know about it because of social media and comment sections on, on articles like yours? Um, I think it is uh, harsher now. It, and I think it, it, it is more divisive. I don't know if it's more divisive than it's ever been. I mean, I was uh, in, in school when uh, Watergate went down, so I wasn't really, you know, uh, you know, I what so I re- I can't do an honest comparison. It's it's more fierce than any time which I can recall. And it's interesting, the uh, the number of folks there was a, a, a woman uh, I was kind of friendly with. Uh, she was in some hiking groups I'm with. And, you know, she was very upset that I was I wasn't calling Trump a, um, you know, fascist, whatever, fill in the blank. And so. The level of personal attacks that I've seen and you know experienced from folks who knew me is like, uh, you know, I don't. Um, it's puzzling, but you know, again, this is modern life. This is modern life, and so okay, so people are going to hate you for uh, people are going to hate you for not as uh, for not attesting to the latest catechism uh, on politics and the president and everything else. It's just like okay, fine, you know, I'll, I'll have another beer. But even though th- this friend you point out, even though she knows you and your work and your history, well, it's not enough. You, you, it's, it's not enough that you even stay silent. You need to affirmatively uh, sort of uh, approve what you call her catechism on, on Trump, for instance. Um, that is true. And, and, and it's interesting to see the level of personal attacks uh, and going back, you know, um, you try to be reasonable on these things, but but you see folks, and it, it's interesting. There's a couple of folks I've talked to. I said, so, you know, they've ranted and raved, and I say, uh, so how's your blood pressure doing? That's, that's, you know, of course it's up. Everybody's blood pressure is up. If you're a decent human being, you're enraged, and you stay enraged. And I said, well, is that healthy? You bastard. Yeah. Okay, you know, I tried. Well, the, I guess part of it is that it is it is your job, in a sense, to chronicle all this. Um, so you can find out more about Jim at jimbovard.com. Uh, tell us about your book that's now on Kindle, Freedom Frauds. What, what do people find in there? Okay, this is a book. Uh, the title is Freedom Frauds. It's a collection of articles I've done for the Future of Freedom Foundation over the last uh, seven or eight years. Uh, it, it has lots of fun stuff on there. This is the, the only political book on Amazon w- uh, which combines hitchhiking, torture, Syria, shovel leading, the Civil War, and police shootings. And it has a fair amount of humor and lots of dirt as well. And, and it's only $3, which is cheaper than the price of a uh, good cigar. I wouldn't know. And, and it's, there was a free promotion today and uh, Friday and then uh, goes back to full price over the weekend. But full price is three dollars, you know. Yeah, I mean, you know, well, folks burn that at Starbucks. Well, I will. I think in Auburn, Alabama, you can still get a Bud Light for three bucks. But uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, if, if you're if you're not reading Jim Bovard, you need to be. Please follow him on Twitter. Go to jimbovard.com. Check out some of his books. You won't be disappointed, especially if you like Mencken, if you like somebody who who casts a jaundiced eye. Uh, towards politics and 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 the folly of, of of politics, and and also if you like somebody who has an entertaining writing style as opposed to a pedantic or academic writing style, I can't recommend Jim's work enough. So with that, Jim, thanks so much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.